Welcome to the next uh, lecture on fluorescence. This is the second part of that. Before that, I would like to spend some time uh, again on the principles what we had discussed in the last class. The that is regarding the instru fluorescence spectrophotometry theoretical aspects. What we did in the last class is essentially to understand what is the for fluorescence phenomenon and uh, phosphorescence phenomenon and uh, photoluminescence phenomenon. What we said was that the electromagnetic radiation is uh, absorbed by a molecule is sometimes re emitted. This phenomenon is known as luminescence. In this process, um, photons of the electromagnetic radiations are absorbed by the molecules and excite them to higher energy levels. When the excited molecule comes down to the ground state, the molecules luminous. This uh, phenomenon is known as photoluminescence. This includes fluorescence as well as phosphorescence method and um, fluorescence occurs in a time span of about 10 raise to minus 5 seconds as the excited states of the molecules are short lived. Phosphorescence involves a change in the electronic uh, spin and hence it is much slower than the fluorescence. The lifetime of the excited species extends in fluorescence from 10 raise to minus 4 seconds to several seconds sometimes even minutes. In photoluminescence processes emission occurs at wavelengths longer than the excitation wavelength. Now, this is the figure we had discussed earlier. The first one is absorption, the second one is fluorescence and third one is phosphorescence. This is on the right hand corner. Here you can see in absorption it comes down to the ground state and uh, of the excited level and then returns to the ground state of the unexcited level. Here it loses the extra energy in uh, different uh, vibrational states of the excited state and then comes down to the ground state, but they may return uh, to any of the vibrational energy levels of the ground state. So, there could be some amount of gradation in the spectra fine structure. So, in phosphorescence apart from the excited energy state there is a separate uh, metastable state. So, from the first excited state they all come down to uh, excited metastable state from there it is it returns to the ground state excited molecules. So, this process takes more time the third one and then we have discussed that fluorescence occurs in gaseous liquid and solid chemical systems. In sodium vapor 3 s electrons are excited to 3 p states by the absorption of 589.6 uh, and 589 nanometers after about 10 raise to minus 8 seconds it returns to the ground state and uh, uh, if the emission occurs at the same wavelength then we call it as resonance fluorescence. Many molecular species emit a radiations at wavelengths longer than the excitation wavelength. This shift is called as Stokes shift and um, what happens in the electronic uh, excitation one is in the ground state it goes to the excited state here the spins are the same as in the ground state one electron is pointing up another is electron is pointing down here even in the excited state there is a same uh, spin. But in the uh, another po possibility is the spin also may change in the excited state. So, the if there is spin there is uh, this is known as triplet state otherwise it is known as singlet state. So, molecular absorption occurs around 10 raise to minus 5 seconds and uh, the properties of the excited triplet state and uh, singlet state differ definitely significantly from each other. So, the radiation induced excitation of ground singlet state has low probability of occurrence for the triplet excited state, 
because triplet excited state is usually a forbidden transitions. Therefore, when both processes occur in the same molecule, phosphorescence wavelengths are much longer than the fluorescence wavelengths. So, the theoretical ex ex aspects we have discussed that is an excited molecule can also return to the ground state by other radiation less processes such as vibrational relaxations, internal conversions, external conversion, inter-system crossing and phosphorescence techniques. So, then we have discussed about vibrational relaxation uh, and then we have discussed about the internal conversions that is between S 2 to S 1 and S 1 to S 0. Uh, usually conversions are accompanied via a series of vibrational relaxations as we have seen in the figure earlier. So, whatever excitation wavelength fluorescence always occurs at the same wavelength. Now, this is an excitation and emission spectra of quinine and uh, you can see that excitation spectrum is only up to 350 uh, nanometers up to 400 whereas, emission spectrum starts from here and the M M lambda max for the excitation occurs around 450 to 460 nanometers. That means, it reaffirms re our uh, su supposition that the excitation um, and emission are slight, uh, slightly different spectra, but they almost look same as you see in this figure here, but the emission spectra lambda max occurs around 450 and this is at 350. Then uh, we have discussed about uh, mechanisms how the uh, electron returns to the ground state by pre dissociation and when the electron moves from higher electronic state to, to an upper vibrational state of a lower electronic state, vibrational energy sometimes would be sufficient to rupture some weak bonds in the chromophore. So, dissociation processes obviously reduce the fluorescence intensity. Therefore, high energy systems should not be used for fluorescence because they could rupture the bonds. Uh, sometimes deactivation involves uh, interaction and energy transfer between the excited molecule and the solvent and other molecules, um, other solutes. This process is known as external conversion. So, sometimes this can lead to enhanced fluorescence also, but the mechanism of such conversation, conversions are not well understood. You would see that uh, um, these reactions are extremely complex and um, a lot of research is required in this area. And then we have discussed about inter-system crossings if there is a triplet transition possible. So, the there could be an overlap between the electronic states of different multiplicities. So, in molecules containing heavy atoms such as iodine or bromine, where spin and orbital interactions are more prominent. The presence of molecular, uh, molecular oxygen in solution also enhances inter system crossing with a consequent decrease in fluorescence. Then we have discussed about phosphorescence and um, here we have already said that uh, crossing from triplet to singlet state internal and external conversions also may take place resulting in decreased fluorescence and this kind of emission is more common in highly viscous media at low temperatures. So, the some of the chemical aspects we have discussed earlier that, that means, we have we cannot use uh, sigma to sigma star transitions because they are highly energetic and they could rupture the bonds instead of exciting the electrons, the electrons are uh, separated from chemical bonding. Therefore, we can surmise that fluorescence can occur not from sigma to sigma star transitions, but from pi star to pi and pi star to n transitions. Among these, the probability of fluorescence occurring is more in n to pi star transition. 
So, molar absorptivity of pi to pi star transitions in general are about 1100 to 1000 folds greater than n 2 pi star transitions. The inherent lifetimes associated with such transitions are of the order of about 10 raise to minus 7 to 10 raise to minus 9 seconds compared with 10 raise to minus 5 to 10 raise to minus 7 seconds for n 2 pi star transitions. So, obviously, n 2 pi star transitions would lead to uh, fluorescence rather than pi to pi star transitions. So, most efficient fluorescence can occur from n 2 pi star excited state which tends to be short lived. In such systems, inter system crossing also would be very less. Afterwards, we have discussed some of the important features of uh, uh, fluorescence and uh, here we have observed some of the uh, uh, features which are characteristics of fluorescence. So, all aromatic compounds containing chromophores usually exhibit low energy pi to pi star transition. This we know already because we have already discussed it even in the when we were uh, even in when we were discussing spectrophotometry. So, aliphatic and aliphacyclic carbonyl structures with conjugated double bonds also may exhibit fluorescence. Then <coughs> um, we would uh, like uh, to show that uh, in such uh, compounds uh, a majority of the unsubstituted hydrocarbons do not fluoresce on their own because most of these substances have got pi to pi, pi bonds. So, pi to pi star uh, transitions may not lead to fluorescence and then we have discussed that uh, compounds with <laughs> um, multiple structures like quinoline this one isoquinoline and indole these have got rigid structures rigid planar structures and um, they could uh, lead to fluorescence. Another possibility is substitution of benzene rings will increase the lambda max of the fluorescence. This is also seen quite often sometimes substitution with halogens decreases the fluorescence. Increasing inter intersystem crossing to the triplet state for example, in iodobenzene and nitrobenzene this would decrease the fluorescence. And suppose we introduce groups such as COOH carbon CO group or aldehyde group like CHO on aromatic ring they would withdraw the electrons from the pi electronic system and make the fluorescence process so much difficult. That means, they inhibit the fluorescence and um, uh, bridged compounds like this what we are having fluorine and biphenyl they show fluorescence stronger than non rigid molecules. This is another uh, um, aspect we have discussed. So, um, lack of rigidity sometimes increases the internal conversion rate and results in consequent increase in the radiation less deactivation. So, in non rigid molecules part of the molecule can undergo low frequency vibrations with respect to other parts which may account for some energy loss. Here I am showing you a quinoline with its complex with zinc and this is uh, two molecules one is to two stoichiometry and uh, uh, this compound fluoresces. Then fluorescence decreases with increasing temperatures this we have discussed and solvent viscosity increases because of the inhomogeneity and solutes and solvents containing heavy atoms decrease fluorescence another observation and uh, that uh, examples I have given are carbon tetrabromide and ethyl iodide. Here spin orbital uh, interactions increase the rate of triplet formation. Then we have discussed that if a substance exhibits more resonance forms more fluorescence could occur that means higher more the structures lower is the energy 
and um, still lower energies are required to excite the electrons to the next higher energy level because the more number of resonance structures will always decrease the system energy. Sometimes pH control is also very important and uh, that results in the fluorescence for anions. Suppose you take a substance um, multi ringed substance into basic medium an anion is produced by dissociation and uh, that could happen uh, that could lead to fluorescence of one of the species that is mostly anions and dissolved oxygen reduces the intensity. Other paramagnetic substance is also uh, present uh, in the sample could decrease the fluorescence. So, with these observations what we can do basically is to try to quantify the fluorescence phenomenon with respect to the concentration if we want to apply the phenomenon for the determination of substances and for this we need to define uh, some of the concepts that is quantum yield we have defined and quantum yield or quantum efficiency or for fluorescence or phosphorescence is defined as the ratio of number of molecules that luminous to the total number of excited molecules and quantum field phi for a compound is determined by the relative rate constants k x of for the process by which the lowest singlet excited state is deactivated. Now, we can write it like this phi is the formation constant k f divided by formation constant and uh, the intersystem crossing and uh, this k mm, e c refers to um, uh, external conversion and then internal conversion another constant pre dissociation and dissociation. So, all the substances all the terms in the denominator would lead to reduced fluorescence. So, if the terms k f, k i c, k e c and k p d and k d if they are reduced then the quantum efficiency would approach unity. So, <coughs> the relationship between fluorescence power and concentration follows basically a similar relationship like Beer Lambert's law that we have tried to uh, try to derive in the previous uh, class and uh, it is the supposed to be proportional to the number of molecules excited which in turn is proportional to the radiant power that is hitting the molecule and uh, th subsequently that is absorbed and then we have written couple of equations involving p f that is uh, radiant power of the fluorescence is a function of the q f that is fluorescence efficiency or quantum yield and corres that corresponds to multiplied by p naught minus p where p naught minus p is the radiant power absorbed by the sample. The fluorescence efficiency is defined as the ratio of the number of photons this we have discussed earlier. We can write uh, using the equations the power of fluorescence emission is proportional to the radiant power of the excitation beam that is absorbed by the system. So, we can write incorporate couple of constants k, di, k double dash. So, fluorescence efficiency multiplied by constant multiplied by the difference in the radiation that is p naught minus p. And um, you, since this is also q f is also a constant for a given system we can convert it into another constant k dash into p naught minus p, but uh, Beer Lambert's law it uh, is nothing but p naught minus p is equal p by p naught is equal to 10 to the power of minus epsilon b c where epsilon is the molar absorptivity of the fluorescing compound and b is the path length and c is the concentration. So, substituting all this in the equation we get fluorescence uh, intensity is proportional to a constant multiplied by p naught and to 1 minus 10 to the power of minus epsilon b c. The exponential in this equation is nothing but a Maclaurin series we can expand it and convert uh, while converting it into 
uh, natural numbers logarithms 2.303 is a factor that emerges then uh, this one and this one uh, expansion term 1 and 1 cancel what we have is 2.303 epsilon b c and all other terms. Now, if the epsilon ratio if the quantities are fluorescence quantities are very low then the square terms and the uh, cubic terms can be neglected. If we do that we will have k dash p naught into 2.303 epsilon b c. So, 1 and 1 will get cancelled the other terms are being neglected. So, when we do this we have um, something like this 2.303 k dash into epsilon b c into p naught the where p naught is the incident energy and uh, this equation holds good only if epsilon b c is very small. This that means, it holds good for only dilute solutions not for concentrated solutions. So, we can we again modify that equation and uh, 2.303 p naught into uh, fluorescence efficiency multiplied by g lambda into q f into epsilon b c that should be all the put all the constants into one uh, another uh, separate constant known as k b c where k represents the products of all other constants and beta is b is the path length and a plot of absorbance fluorescence versus concentration should be a straight line at low concentrations. Normally, linearity is high in fluorescence and it uh, uh, covers the order of about 2 to 3 magnitude of concentration. So, in this equation uh, if you plot it would look something like this and um, uh, there will be some sort of a reversal concentration at uh, fluorescence at higher concentrations. Now, that equation 7 if you do not remember we can go back this equation f is equal to 2.303 p naught into f phi into g lambda q f into epsilon b c. This equation is interesting from two aspects. One is it shows that the sensitivity can be increased by working at high excitation power because it is proportional to p naught. So, if we use higher p naught the fluorescence also is directly proportional. So, it increases the fluorescence and uh, for this reason we try to use higher uh, intensity of the source and uh, then we get low large signal to noise ratio also. Since the source intensity can change from time to time fluorescent signals cannot be operated measured in absolute parameters because the source intensity itself if it is changing there is no specific point for which we can refer. That means, they are always expressed only as relative fluorescence with this instrument with our source we got so much of reading that is what we are essentially aiming at. So, these are uh, made. So, how do we go for internal comparisons? One thing is we can uh, um, take a reference standard and specify the conditions for the reference standard and under the same set of parameters like slit width, uh, fluor source intensity etcetera you can measure and report your fluorescence measurements. So, um, they of course, they must be corrected for background correction uh, background fluorescence also. And another is interesting feature of this equation is the freedom to adjust slit widths. Remember we discussed about the intensity source intensity p naught if I can use higher intensity I, my fluorescence range increases. So, if I use more slit that means, I am permitting more of the incident light to fall on the sample. So, this also could lead to higher uh, fluorescence. So, the slit widths in spect spectrofluorometry are much more important than in the spectrophotometry 
I use higher slit width, I increase the source intensity. I use better source with better intensity, I can get higher fluorescence. So, both these aspects are covered by the expression number 7, which we discussed in the previous uh, uh, slides. So, it also depends upon the beam geometry. Suppose, I use a different angle uh, like uh, uh, instead of a small beam passing through, I can use a bigger beam and then more light will pass through. So, this is how I can look at the slit width and the beam geometry. Therefore, all slit widths are critical factors in fluorescence instead of the actual cell dimensions. Even though we use the cell dimensions standard cells, they are not so important in the measurement of fluorescence. But slit widths are the critical factors and solid angle to which on which we focus the spectrophoto on the cell containing the sample is more important. So, this aspect we should uh, remember. So, you can see in this figure that uh, the we have a slit emission excitation beam. The excitation beam passes from this slit onto the sample and then I am measuring the fluorescence at right angles through, through another slit. So, this is the observation angle. So, we are suppose I measure on this angle somewhere here. That means, I will be measuring fluorescence as well as absorbance. That is not correct. When we want to measure fluorescence, we should always measure at right angles. Not necessarily at right angles, but at a solid angle. Now, you can look at this figure also. If my if I arrange this slit horizontally like this, instead of like this, if I arrange it horizontally like this, then the flows, any incident light will fall on a solid block and it comes out again uh, measured at right angles through another slit, which is also arranged horizontally. This gives me a freedom to use a very small sample as big as or as small as the slit width, what we are employing. This is the beauty of uh, spectrofluorometry. That means, so solution volumes are not so important in spectrofluorescence measurements. What we need is the solid angle coming from the slit and the geometry of measurement. So, we can work with very, very, very small amounts of the order of about few microliters using spectrofluorimetry. Now, you, we can discuss this further that is if the analyte is too concentrated, then what happens? The fluorescence versus concentration curve reaches a maximum and falls off. Now, this we have curve I have shown you earlier this one, it uh, comes back and then it, the fluorescence curve falls off and um, this behavior can be attributed to the attenuation of the uh, signal exciting radiation as it passes through the cell and results in a further decrease in the exciting power. Suppose, you have a <coughs> figure like this, fluorescence intensity is coming out like this. The portion here would receive much more radiation than is another portion somewhere here. This receives more radiation and this receives less radiation. Subsequently, if the cell is bigger, so if the analyte is too concentrated like I was explaining, 
the fluorescence versus concentration reaches a maximum and falls off and um, the portion of the sample that is near the receiving end of the incoming radiation will receive more incident power than the sections which are farther away. So, this behavior can be attributed to the attenuation of the exciting radiation itself as it passes through the cell and results in a further decrease in the exciting power. Therefore, the same fluorescence reading can indicate two concentrations. One is it can uh, indicate one concentration as it falls, but as uh, subsequently the total fluorescence if you measure it would be lower than that. So, depending upon the thickness of the fluorescence section it can indicate two concentrations. Therefore, another phenomenon that occurs in highly concentrated solutions is that the excited molecule uh, may form a complex with another ground state molecule not with the excited state, this can cause a bathochromic shift that means towards longer wavelength regions. This phenomenon is known as self quenching and the complex is called an excimer and uh, dilution we can uh, reduce this effect by dilution to some extent because the excimer concentration varies as the square of the solute concentrations. So, um, how does an excitation and emission spectra look? Uh, here I have shown the, a figure, I, uh, the explanations are uh, here. Generally, a fluorescence compound is associated with three types of photoluminescence spectra. One is it, the first step involves the generation of the absorption spectrum to determine whether the compound is capable of absorbing and only if a substance is absorbing then it can be fluorescing. If it does not absorb there is no question of fluorescence. So, a substance should have uh, an absorbing structure and then another spectra would be fluorescent spectra that is excitation and another could be the emission spectra that is fluorescence. So, fluorescent spectrum is obtained by measuring the luminescence intensity at the fixed wavelength where the excitation occurs. Now, you can see here again I am going back to a figure one is epsilon figure E in this this is a phenanthrene phenanthrene compound it has got an absorption spectrum and then it has got an excitation spectrum and then it has also got an emission spectrum. Among these most of the organic compounds would be having absorption spectrum, but that is no guarantee that a substance uh, usually an absorbing compound fluoresces there is no guarantee, but a fluorescing compound can definitely will have absorb, absorbing uh, spectrum. So, a fluorescing compound like this phenanthrene or any other compound for that matter would exhibit three spectrums. One is the absorption spectrum that is on the left part and then excitation spectrum and the fluorescent spectrum. So, how do you uh, get a fluorescent spectrum? It is obtained by measuring the luminescence intensity at a fixed wavelength while the excitation wavelength is varied. For example, in this figure um, I can get this spectrum by measuring the fluorescence using 500 nanometers fixed and you vary between 300 to 400 in this range. So, I get the excitation spectrum and if I have to determine this spectrum emission spectrum I have to fix this fluorescent spectrum somewhere between 350 between 300 and with here is the fluorescence maximum here and then I have to vary the wavelength of the detector from 500 to 600 I will get a spectrum like this. So, one um, when you are measuring excitation 
you have to fix the emission wavelength and when you are measuring the emission spectrum you have to fix the excitation wavelength obviously it will be good if you could uh, if you could uh, um, get the highest sensitivity therefore for fluorescence we should always use highest excitation wavelength but uh, we have to simultaneously we have to make sure that we do not use too energetic uh, radiations below 200 nanometers for example uh, sigma to sigma star transition we have already discussed that uh, they could lead to uh, rupture of the bonds instead of fluorescence now generally <laughs> uh, we have uh, discussed this earlier that is uh, once the excitation wavelength is determined fluorescence and phosphorescence spectra can be recorded by measuring the emission intensity as a function of the wavelength. Now, fluorescence and phosphorescence bands are also found at longer wavelengths as pointed out earlier I have discussed this and the wavelength difference between the two we can calculate the energy corresponding to the wavelength difference simply by using Einstein equation E is equal to m c square and uh, <coughs> uh, h c by lambda energy is equal to h c by lambda if we know the lambda we can determine the energy difference. So, the energy difference can be cal calculated only if we know the difference between the singlet and triplet state if we can uh, the how do we know that the by measuring the wavelengths. So, if you know the wavelengths you can calculate the corresponding energy levels and a phosphorescing compound would show the difference between the singlet and triplet state energy levels if you can simply measure the wavelengths that is a very beautiful uh, concept to determine the energy of the triplet states. So, in true spectrofluorimeters fluorometers excitation spectrum as well as the fluorescence emission can be obtained. So, excitation spectrum uh, with suitable corrections for source output intensity and detector response as a function of the wavelength an absolute excitation spectrum can be obtained. What do we mean by this is the fixed wavelength you are using for measuring the fluorescence and the excitation while the excitation wavelength is scant and with suitable corrections for the source output energy and the detector response as a function of wavelength an absolute excitation spectrum we can obtain which closely should resemble the absorption spectrum otherwise there is no fluorescence nor fluorescence phosphorescence. So, the emission spectrum again I have uh, put, uh, put it here that by fixing the optimum excitation wavelength I am again specifying and um, uh, highlighting this aspect because quite often fluorescence uh, spectrums are lost if you do not use the proper excitation wavelengths and uh, both emission and excitation spectra are approximately mirror images of each other because the vibrational energy differences for the ground and excited uh, electronic states are also roughly the same that is why the excitation as well as absorption spectrum have to be similar. So, you can look at uh, the figure here fluorescence spectra of the anthracene and the, the first part on the top is excitation here you can see 1, 2, 3, 4 figures um, 4 peaks and uh, that is the excitation and uh, at the bottom you can see this is the mirror image of this and this is the second peak in the excitation in the emission second peak in the emission is the mirror image of the third peak in the excitation and uh, this one third peak in the emission is the mirror image of the first peak in the excitation and the fourth one in emission is the mirror image of the first peak that is this corresponds to this and the second one corresponds to this longer wavelength this one is this and this one is this. So, if you can take a look at both the emission and excitation spectrum you will be surprised 
that quite often they are the mirror images of each other. Uh, it is a fantastic concept, but it is a fact. Now, uh, let us look at the instrumentation of the spectrophoto fluorimeters. What we need is uh, for the instrumentation is a source of radiation and then I would need a monochromator or a filter to choose the excitation wavelength and that excitation wavelength I must focus on the sample cell and I have to measure fluorescence on the uh, at the right angle of the incident radiation. That means, <laughs> if the incident radiation is coming vertically, I must have a uh, provision to make the measurement horizontally. And then, how do I measure? I need the, here I need the emission wavelength. That means, I have to put one more monochromator or filter and uh, that wavelength would be different from the excitation monochromator. So, uh, in all spectrophotometers, this is the standard feature that is from the source you need one for monochromator for the excitation and after the excitation you need one more monochromator or a filter to take out the emission spectrum and that radiation is allowed to fall on the detector and uh, uh, you can have a beam attenuator here from the source, you can split it and then convert it into using electronics, make it fall on this, then you can take the ratio of the incident radiation to that of the fluorescent radiation. So, this is a very simple optics of a fluorescent spectrophotometer. Uh, in general, what are the important source now that we have discussed is it should have a source <laughs> and then it should have a um, monochromator for excitation, it should have the sample cell and a sample compartment in which you can insert the sample like what we showed in the first class of this uh, discussion on fluorescence the, and then we need the uh, emission monochromator that comes out after the fluorescence, we have to measure it at right angles whatever comes out at the right angles, I need one more monochromator or a filter uh, followed by the detector. So, these are the essential components of a spectrophotometer, we will discuss these things one by one. Now, to the first of all let us discuss the radiation sources. So, first is best that is high pressure xenon lamp, arc lamp, high pressure xenon arc lamp is the most preferred choice for high quality work. What are the technicals? It should be a lamp of about 75 to 450 watts, it gives intense radiation and relatively stable output. Sometimes the uh, out, uh, there could be a drift, uh, I have written here at the bottom long term stability, you would see about 1 percent drift per hour and that is limited by the arc wander and electrode wear. If you run it for long time, you would need a stabilizer and also the electrode will wear out and then you need to bring them nearer and um, to maintain the same lamp intensity because the lamp becomes very hot, you have to have a cooling system around the lamp to get the optimum output and the power supply has to be between 5 to 20 angstroms at 15 to 30 volts. Now, the output is approximate that of a black body radiation. Now, this black body radiation is uh, uh, essentially a continuous uh, continuum radiation with an output from 300 to 1300 nanometers and it is pulsed to obtain higher peak intensities. AC signals from the transducers also can be amplified and processed. So, um, the most preferred one is 
high pressure xenon arc lamp and then we can if you do not have that um, ac accuracy required then you can go for a xenon flash lamp. Here the discharge is produced by high energy flash using a charged capacitor discharge through a lamp filled with xenon. So, what you need is a 0.8 mm capillary flash lamp that produces an image of 2 mm wide and 18 millimeter height. This is also very useful for uh, micro cell and for continuous flow measurements. So, this xenon uh, flash lamp is typically low cost and having a compact source. Then another source is blue light emitting blue light emitting LEDs. Basically, LEDs are very small uh, lights with about 0.1 to 0.3 volts and uh, if you take a blue light emitting LEDs, they emit radiation between 450 to 475 nanometers, but uh, you need to coat the LEDs with fluorophores and um, uh, inside the bulb and then mixtures of phosphors can provide excitation wavelengths up to 375 nanometer that is good enough for most of the organic uh, uh, compounds. So, another uh, source is low pressure mercury vapor lamp. Here mercury vapor lamp is uh, very common, very cheap and you can just buy it across the shelf in the uh, uh, in the city wherever you are living and it gives you it is it has to be coated with a phosphor to emit a nearly continuous spectrum. You would have seen lot of mercury vapor lamps in your town or somewhere around and um, nowadays uh, people are using uh, CFLs and uh, this is essentially the same uh, composition, but it will be a single bulb, single lamp etcetera coated with a phosphor. They may also be used with a clear bulb, you, know, you need not uh, coat it with uh, uh, phosphor. Now, when you coat it with phosphor, you get a continuous spectrum that means, you can choose the excitation wavelength from 350 to 475 or something like that. And um, if you use a clear quartz uh, window, then you get intense emission lines corresponding to 253.7 nanometer that is a very strong uh, radiation 253 and 313 nano, nanometer is the medium uh, strength uh, wavelength. You will get one more line spectrum and uh, at 365 is one more that is also medium 404, 407 and 435.8 nanometer this is very strong one and 546.1 strong and 577.0 is medium and 579.1 mm nanometer radiations. What does it mean? It gives you a radiation comprising a group of wavelengths which correspond to 253.7, 313, 365, 404, 407.8, 435.8, 546, 577 and 579.1 that is if you use a clear mercury lamp. Suppose you use a coated uh, phosphor coated mercury lamp, it will give you a diffused wavelength and the concentration and the, and the strength of these lines uh, would be much lower in the phosphor coated lamps. Whereas, if you use a clear lamp, they would give you the radiation corresponding to this as a very high absorbance uh, intensity basically. So, Mercury vapor pressure lamp uh, would have approximately 10 torrs of vapor pressure in the lamps, not more. So, mercury arc discharge lamps also emit very diffuse radiation of much lower intensity than with high pressure arc lamps. Sometimes, so uh, it is uh, if you want to use line sources you have to you would be using only one or two emission uh, excitation wavelengths. So, most uh, in most of the regular instruments 253.7 is a very normal uh, excitation wavelength, 
So, if you provide a filter removing all other wavelengths, you would be getting a very high strength 253.7 nanometers. And suppose you want 313, you need to use another filter. So, like that different filters are available where you can choose the excitation wavelength. So, inter the in general what we do is we use interference filters to select individual mercury lines that is very important. So, unlike xenon arc lamps which will give you high intensity continuous wavelength for excitation, mercury lamps will give you high intensity specific lines, but very few lines uh, and um, this could be used in low end instruments. In high end instruments mercury lamp I mean uh, xenon arc lamp and in low end instruments mercury lamp is preferred. Now, we can also use lasers for example, N D AG laser that gives you fixed wavelength laser of very high intensity but also used in fluorescence detectors therefore. Why? Because they give you only one wavelength and any of the fluorescing compound which can get excited at that particular wavelength only can be used for fluorescence. So, these have got somewhat limited applicability compared to xenon arc lamp and LED and mercury lamps. My order of preference would be first preference is xenon arc lamp. If I have the spectrofluorometric measurements to be made on um, and high level measurements that is um, corrected spectra, excitation wavelength I want to choose, emission wavelength I want to choose etcetera all these things. Uh, first preference would be xenon arc lamp followed by mercury lamp followed by other uh, if I do not have both of them then I would rather go for simple LEDs and if LEDs are also not available I would like to go for uh, N D AG laser. Now, let us look at the optics and um, usually we have two types of instruments one is filter photometers filter spectrofluorometer sorry it has to be filter spectrofluorometers follow or filter spectrophotometers spectrofluorometers. So, a filter fluorometer usually employs a mercury lamp as an excitation source primary filter is required to transmit the desired excitation wavelength through the optical cell another filter is known as the secondary filter that is what we discussed to measure the M a fluorescence radiation onto the detector for measurement. The secondary filter also serves to absorb this scattered radiation uh, excitation radiation. So, we will continue our discussion on filter photometers as well as spectrofluorometers in the next class that is we will concentrate more on the optics in the next class optics and detectors etcetera. So, I would uh, uh, stop here so that you could um, try to understand what are the basic things involved in the optics of a spectrofluorometer or filter fluorometer for that matter.